Late on the day of the 26th of June, the Sioux and Northern Cheyenne began their movement to the headwaters of the Little Bighorn, some 35 air miles from the battlefield. They had two primary goals. One, get clear of any soldiers, and two, resume the buffalo hunt. After spending a couple of weeks in the area and celebrating their victory, they headed northeast, burning the prairie behind them to discourage pursuit and to create fresh grasslands. Passing close to the battlefields of June, they moved to the Powder River area, and here the great Indian village of the summer of 1876 began to break apart. The Northern Cheyenne chose to stay in the Powder River country, and the Lakota split into many different villages. The two biggest were those of Sitting Bull, who moved towards the Little Missouri River, and Crazy Horse, who would soon turn south towards the Black Hills. These villages continued to move without hindrance as the army tried to recover from the Little Bighorn fight. But the last great coalition of natives on the Northern Plains was over. A shocked and rattled General Terry decided to return to the Yellowstone River, get things sorted out, and plead to General Sheridan for reinforcements. Movement north began with the loading of the 41 wounded onto the steamer far west at the confluence of the Bighorn and Little Bighorn. Eventually, the far west would transport the wounded all the way back to Fort Lincoln. And along with those 41 wounded was a severely wounded cavalry horse. Riding over the battlefield, Benteen counted over 70 dead horses, and he watched as the troopers dispatched the wounded ones, with the exception of Captain Keogh's horse, Comanche. Discovered with seven wounds, Comanche would become known as the sole survivor of Custer's battalion. However, history is never as clean-cut as one is told, or rather led to believe. Indeed, another horse named Knapp, a gray, was discovered by the river. I have not found much in the way of sources for this horse, so if you have information on Knapp, please comment below. Few people know of this horse, Knapp. I guess since Walt Disney did not make a movie about him. On July 2nd, Terry's column arrived at the Yellowstone River and would remain in the area for the entire month of July. The battle was over, but a war of words began, and you could say continues to this day. A reporter, an Irishman from the New York Herald, James O'Kelly, arrived in camp and quickly grew fond of both Major Reno and Captain Benteen. However, as he made his rounds of the soldiers and the other officers, he uncovered much grumbling and unrest. In an article published on September 21st, O'Kelly wrote, No confidence can be placed in the official report of the Battle of the 25th of June. It's full of inaccuracies and has been read with something approaching astonishment by the men who took part in the fight. Terry sent word of the Little Bighorn defeat by telegraph to General Sheridan and Sherman, which reached them on July 4th in Philadelphia as they were preparing for the centennial celebration. The news shocked them, and it shocked the nation, and they would start planning their revenge. As for General Crook, he learned of Custer's defeat on July 10th at his base called Camp Cloud Peak, where he had been amusing himself after the Battle of the Rosebud by hunting, fishing, and playing cards. If he had any plans to act, he told nobody about them. Whatever his intentions, the news of Custer's defeat caused him to stay put until reinforced. This inaction only increased the grumblings of his men and officers, dubbing him with the unflattering nickname Rosebud George. Indeed, Crook had been trying to spin the battle of the Rosebud as a victory. You know, commanders can fool themselves, but they cannot fool the troops, who considered the fight anything but a victory. The next day on July 11th, 200 scouts under the Shoshone chief Washiki arrived at camp. Recall that they had gone home shortly after the Battle of the Rosebud. While George Crook enjoyed the Bighorn Mountains, Sheridan sent several messages to Crook asking him to hit the Sioux hard. He just simply disobeyed Sheridan and refused to move, choosing to wait for the arrival of 10 companies of the 5th Cavalry Regiment led by Colonel Wesley Merritt, 
before he would continue the campaign. Sheridan grew tired of the inaction and the incessant pleas for reinforcements, so he ordered Terry and Crook to unite, and they decided to comply. Sheridan also received approval for his plan to have the military take control of the agencies and then move in and seize all weapons and horses. As we will see in the next episode, Crook disobeyed Sheridan again uh, when it came to the confiscation of those weapons and horses. Terry and Crook both advanced on August 5th. Reinforcing General Terry was the newly arrived 5th Infantry Regiment under the command of the egotistical and sometimes abrasive Colonel Nelson Miles. He had won the Medal of Honor in the Civil War for leading a fierce defense at Chancellorsville as commander of the 61st New York. During the battle, he suffered a severe abdominal wound that the surgeon pronounced mortal. Miles refused to die and would recover and take part in the final battles in Virginia. Crook's command consisted of 10 companies of infantry, it's about 450 men, 25 companies of cavalry, just over 1,500 men, the 200 scouts, and a pack train. Per Crook's instructions, the column traveled light, taking along only 15 days of supply. He had the supply train remain behind, defended by some 200 civilians and soldiers, and it would remain at Camp Cloud Peak until mid-September when Crook recalled it. With poor information as to the whereabouts of the hostiles, Crook and Terry linked up, well, more accurately, stumbled into each other on August 10th along Rosebud Creek. From there, the combined force moved to Powder River, arriving there on the 12th. The combined command was too cumbersome and had no hope of success. General Crook was chomping at the bit to resupply his command and break free of General Terry, who was now technically his superior. He was not the only one dissatisfied with the situation. Nelson Miles wrote his wife, The more I see of movements here, the more admiration I have for Custer, and I am satisfied his like will not be found very soon again. The Shoshone scouts must have agreed with Miles as they left and went home. Even Buffalo Bill Cody, who had scouted for Crook during the march, left in disgust. Resupplied and with fresh intelligence, the strained relationship between Crook and Terry ended on August 26th, when Crook broke free to pursue Crazy Horse and to protect the mining camps in the Black Hills, which, by the way, would never face a serious threat. On the other hand, Terry would attempt to find any Indians that had crossed the Yellowstone and were heading north, possibly to Canada. Unseasonably heavy rains battered the columns and turned the landscape into a sea of mud. At times it was so difficult for the horses to move that the infantry would outpace their mounted brethren. On 5 September, Terry had seen enough and called an end to his expedition. Gibbon returned to Fort Ellis, and the 7th returned to Fort Lincoln, where it arrived on the 26th. More importantly, Terry had Colonel Miles establish a cantonment at the mouth of the Tongue River. As we shall see, Miles, with his independent command, would become a menace to the Indian villages that winter. Meanwhile, Crook's command struggled across the unforgiving landscape of southeast Montana, for the most part retracing the route the 7th Cavalry had taken in June. The force halted on September 4th at the same campsite along the Little Missouri River the 7th had used in late May. The next day there was sporadic fighting, and the scout, Big Bat Poirier, narrowly escaped being killed as Crook moved the column east. That night, he resolved to head south to the Black Hills, 180 miles away. Note that the troops had only two days of rations left, so the order went out to go on half rations for a force that was already exhausted, half sick, and malnourished. The safe bet would have been to move to Fort Lincoln or back to the Glendive Depot and resupply, but Crook would rationalize his decision, writing to Sheridan the importance of safeguarding the Black Hills. So on 6 September, he moved south. In even worse shape than the men were the horses and pack mules, and they started to give out. 
Within a couple of days, about a third of the 1,500 cavalrymen were on foot. The troopers shot the abandoned horses and, when possible, added the meat to their diet, which in many cases was emotionally disturbing for the troopers who had spent at least the last four months relying upon and caring for the animals. Becoming desperate, late on the 7th, Crook put together a small force to advance to the Black Hills and acquire provisions. He assigned command of this team to Captain Anson Mills, who had performed well at the Battle of the Rosebud. Mills' force consisted of 150 cavalrymen with the best possible horses and a pack train of 60 mules led by the second-in-command, Lieutenant Bubb. Of course, we now have another controversy. Captain Mills would maintain that Crook advised him to attack any manageable village along his route. Lieutenant Bubb would maintain that Crook stated he should bypass any village and continue on to the Black Hills. What is not controversial is that Crook told Mills that he expected to remain in camp the next day. Mills assembled his force and moved 18 miles in five hours that evening. In the morning, they continued the march. Then in the afternoon, the fog lifted and the scout Gruard reported a pony herd ahead, a clear sign that a village was nearby. Mills had the command move into a hide position. Then Gruard and Mills went forward to conduct a reconnaissance. A recon of an Indian village is easier said than done, and fearing discovery, the two ended their attempt, learning very little in the process. So if you were in Captain Mills's boots, what would you do? Attack? Bypass? And then given your choice, when would you begin? Also, would you send word back to the main column of the situation? Well, Mills decided to attack, and to do so at first light the next morning, 9 September. Mills argued that no village of Indians could stand and fight before a surprise attack by determined soldiers. His plan consisted of dividing the force into three columns. To the west would be Lieutenant Crawford with 57 men, and in the east, another 53 men under the Prussian-born Lieutenant von Lutwitz. Both of these groups were to fight dismounted. The main strike force would be 25 mounted men. Let me say that again. 25 mounted men led by Lieutenant Schwatka. Even more amazingly, Mills ignored the counsel of his officers and decided to not send a message back to Crook. In the dark, the command deployed, not knowing what awaited them. The village they would charge consisted of about four dozen lodges, so around 250 people. Most of them were mini Kanju, led by the chief American horse, and on their way to return to the Spotted Tail Agency. At first light, Mills ordered the charge, and it was a total surprise, and the terrified villagers fled to the south and west, abandoning their possessions and only getting off a few shots. One of those shots hit von Lutwitz in the kneecap, a wound that required amputation of the leg later that day. Firing remained sporadic until daylight revealed to Mills that warriors were assembling in the distance, indicating that another village was nearby. So he secured the village, then ordered Bub forward with the packs, and then finally ordered two men to ride back and tell Crook he needed assistance. A standoff ensued and a number of warriors with excellent cover and concealment from a ravine sniped at the troopers and even verbally taunted them. You know, it is often said that it is better to be lucky than good. On this day, Mills was very lucky, as Crook had not remained stationary the previous day, but had pushed forward some 24 miles. So when the messengers met the column, Crook ordered Wesley Merritt to advance with whatever cavalrymen still had capable mounts. Witnesses described General Crook as barely able to contain his anger about Mills attacking the village and not dispatching a message with his intentions. The general led the cavalry column of around 250 men onto the battlefield close to noon, saving Mills from potential disaster. With the troops posted into defensive positions, the destruction of the village began. The troopers found a 7th Cavalry guide on 
and a glove inscribed with the name Captain Miles Keogh. Skirmishing continued into the afternoon, and an attack against the ravine resulted in a mortally wounded American horse surrendering along with some warriors, uh, some women, and some children. George Crook would release the captives the next day, uh, but this picture shows those that actually decided to stay with his column, including the male charging bearer, who would later become an army scout. Late in the afternoon, Crazy Horse arrived with an estimated 600 warriors, and skirmishing continued until dark, with Crook's weary, hungry men unable to mount any decisive attacks. The Battle of Slim Buttes had cost Crook four killed and 15 wounded, while the estimated native casualties are 10 killed, including three women and one child, and an unknown number of wounded. On the 10th, the command continued to move south under the continual gaze of Indian warriors. And that night, Crook once again dispatched Mills and Bub to get to the Black Hills. The rainy weather continued, and the command at times was strung out over 20 miles, with men and beasts collapsing under the strain. Finally, on the 13th, the word arrived that Mills was on his way back with provisions, so Crook forced marched the command six miles to the Belfouche River, where it would await its salvation. Later that day, the soldiers spotted the first relief column, this one with 50 head of cattle. Behind that came numerous supply wagons and throngs of grateful citizens from Crook City and Deadwood. If you are a fan of the great HBO series Deadwood, uh, this reality is a bit different from what is portrayed in, in Season 1, Episode 12. Captain Bub, that gopher-faced merchant's agent is trying for her eye teeth, General. I'd rather reprovision with the fucking Sioux. I have three men under guard for burying the uniforms and five for bartering the weapons. I have to personally confess that I watched that entire series probably seven times when I was in Iraq. And I have to tell you, it helped maintain my sanity in that place of utter madness. Okay, enough of my problems. Sheridan sent word to Crook that he required his presence at Fort Laramie. Leaving Meriton Command, Crook departed and made the truck to Fort Laramie, and he also ordered the return of his supply train. While touted as a success, the Battle of Slim Buttes would be overshadowed by the debilitation of Crook's command, and the campaign is better recognized as the horse meat, or alternatively, the starvation march. More importantly, the so-called hostile bands still roamed the territory at will. The conflict was about to take some very strange twists and turns. 